Hello, party people, and welcome to my backyard in Las Vegas, technically Henderson, Nevada. We're a little bit off the Las Vegas Strip. It's about a 15-minute drive to the Strip where we are going tonight for uh, dinner. Uh, people ask me all the time, you know, Brent, how's it like living in Las Vegas? Uh, does it get overwhelming? And normally when people are asking that, it's because they've been to Las Vegas and they did all kinds of crazy stuff. They got drunk, they partied, they went to clubs, they got dehydrated, they ate fatty foods, and they did this for like 72 hours straight. And then as they're stumbling out on the plane, they're like, I don't know how anyone could possibly live in Las Vegas. Well, the key is that you don't do, live like that 24 seven, is that you just go and dabble on the strip every now and then and enjoy yourself. Uh, and then the rest of the time you take care of yourself, you stay hydrated in this case with a tasty gin and tonic. Um, but I love living here. I've come to visit here uh, for years since uh, Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp had the intersections conference here. Um, I totally fell in love with Las Vegas. I don't gamble at all. Uh, I say at all, every now and then I'll throw 20 bucks in a slot machine or um, in like penny slots because it's fun just to, to see. But I don't, I don't go to gamble. Really, I look at Las Vegas as like a city that's subsidized. If there's only like 300,000 people here uh, who live here full time. Uh, and it's basically subsidized by all the tourists and convention goers who come in here and pour all kinds of money and all kinds of crazy, <gasps> excuse me, businesses. Um, so it's a phenomenal place to live. There's always incredible concerts. We were partying with Bruno Mars on New Year's Eve. Just crazy things going on all the time. So it's an amazing place to live. You just don't, you can't live like that 24-7. We have a friend of ours, uh, those of you who follow him on, Shafi on uh, TikTok, Shafiq Herji, who does party like that all the time. And that guy, I don't, I don't understand how he has the stamina in order to do it. The dude's out at clubs like five, six nights a week and, and can actually keep up, which I'm like, oh my God, it would kill me. I would kill for his, uh, his uh, capabilities there. So let's go through your top voted questions from Polgab. The top voted one is from, I want to say his name's Tony Frost, says, are you familiar with SQL Server assemblies uh, and can they cause assertions or I am corruptions? So me personally, I'm not that familiar with assemblies. It's one of those things where I'm just like, if you know C Sharp really well and you want to write extended DLLs that you're going to put into SQL Server's memory space, if you want to do that, I'm cool with it. As long as you show me how you do memory troubleshooting, show me how you can tell if you've got a memory leak or how much memory your process is consuming on a regular basis. If you can't show me that, then I'm probably going to have problems. But as long as you can show me that, I don't really care. I don't go into diagnostics. I'm like, look, if you want to do that, that's on you. What worries me is when you say, can they cause assertions or I am corruptions? It sounds like you're having assertions and I am corruptions, in which case you just want to call Microsoft for support, provide them with the memory dumps for whenever the assertions are happening, um, and they'll be glad to read the memory dumps for you and uh, give you a root. I, I say root cause analysis. They won't go into your code, but they'll say that this DLL, for example, was uh, uh, involved when the thing went down. Um, Generally speaking, SQL Server shouldn't be having assertions or IAM corruptions. So I, I wouldn't necessarily jump straight to the DLLs or to somebody's code. I would do a holistic environment review and just say, okay, what all else have we got going on here that might be suspicious? Normally when I see people doing assertion or having assertions, they're running on really crappy hardware, really crappy VMs outdated drivers and we just move everything towards more current stuff and then they're okay. But it's, it's theoretically possible that the uh, C-sharp code could be doing it. Next up, SQL Linux asks, Hi Brent, my company is wanting to use AI for data analytics. What common misconceptions have you seen companies hold concerning using AI to find insights? 
So I use AI all the time. You'll see me doing it if you attend my live streams, for example. Um, I love ChatGPT, I love Claude, I love Gemini, I love self-hosted LLMs. They're really good at being creative and it, creative is interesting in that it, it'll find solutions that I'm not use, used to thinking of. I don't know that total creativity is the right word for it. Um, but the thing you got to watch out for is that they're not very good at things that require a definitive answer, like what is profit? If, it, if you want to look at your data model and say, how much profit did we make from bicycles last year? They're extraordinarily bad at that, at figuring out what the whole total profit actually means, when, how much expenses they have to take into account. Um, so I, I'm all for using AI to go spelunk through your data to find creative, interesting outliers in data. And if you're worried about users using AI to come up with interesting things to go investigate, I'd say don't worry about it. Let your users, if your users are finding a new way to fall in love with the data, that's great. I want my users to go spelunking through the data. I want them to find uh, any way that they can find the data useful makes you more valuable as a data professional because it'll just open up more questions and then they'll want more definitive answers. And when they start to drill down into the underlying facts with AI, they may run into some, they, they will run into some problems where the data isn't quite right and they'll get you involved. But let them go spelunking. It's totally okay. It's totally fine. And let's be honest, if they're using humans to write reporting queries, those humans aren't getting all the joins and filters right anyway. You've seen the kinds of queries that they write. You know they're hot garbage, so how much are we really losing there? Uh, next up, uh, Culloden asks, my company is small and we don't have developers for reporting. My finance team uses prod for reports development because the data is always near real time. That's not unusual. That's actually fairly common. Culloden says, I want to move them to a dev instance, but the data can only be a few hours old. What options are there for this? Well, if you want a readable reporting replica, as soon as you offload the data to another server and people are querying it, you have to license it and it's not development. If people, like you said, uh, we don't have devs for reporting and the finance team is using production for reports development. I don't think that's really development. I think they're writing reports and consuming the data. So I don't, especially when you say the data can only be a few hours old, I don't think that's development. I think that's production. And so if you're doing that, you are going to have to license it for production. There aren't a lot of cheap ways of doing that. So what I, I do with my clients, and I'm not saying you're going to be able to do this, but I'm, what I do with my clients is I say, okay, you want to offload queries to another server. What would be the hardware spec on that server? Let's say it's eight cores. It's probably going to be, have to be enterprise edition if we do near real-time replication. You can do replication with standard edition. It just is a giant pain in the rear to maintain and make sure it stays working. So if you're going to license eight cores with Enterprise Edition, that's $56,000 worth of licensing. Hey, what would it look like if we took that same hardware that you were going to use on the secondary and we just added it to the primary? Would that get us to the point where our regular users are happier and our reports users are happier? For me, with my clients, that's been the answer that's gotten me across the finish line almost every time. When we look at how much power <coughs> they were going to have to add to that secondary and just add it to production as an experiment, because it doesn't cost you any overhead in terms of management, that's usually a much faster way to cross to the finish line. Uh, next up, App Developer asks, when did you decide to stick with SQL Server? After three jobs over eight years, I'm feeling like it's time to become an expert in something. I've been there for a long time. 
So when did I choose to stay with SQL Server? I don't know that I ever made a conscious choice to stay with it. I can tell you when I made a conscious choice to leave it. Uh, but I made a con I don't know that I ever made a conscious choice to stay with it. it. For me as a career, I'm always kind of like willing to be flexible. Um, I'll stick with something as long as it can provide a good uh, lifestyle, he says, sitting in front of the pool, drinking a gin and tonic. I'm willing to stay with something as long as it provides a good lifestyle. Um, but I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever said, oh, I, I want to stick with this one technology. The one thing that's nice about SQL Server is that if you learn it, and depending on what you learn, you said app development. Depending on what you learn, you can take that SQL knowledge and you can apply it to other places as long as you stick with general SQL and you don't get too involved in Microsoft specific stuff, like things that are only available in SQL Server, reporting services, integration services, analysis services, um, uh, uh, big data clusters before they died. As long as you stick with stuff that's relatively general, your skills are still relatively portable and you can move them somewhere else. So that's why I don't know that I could really say that I ever decide to st stick with it. We'll do one more. My tea got cold asks, did resumable online index rebuilds change any of your opinions on, <gasps> excuse me, any of your opinions on or approaches to index maintenance? Maybe I need a song. Maybe I need a dance. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Hey, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Hey, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Hey, what's the problem you want to solve? We'll see if that catches on. So what, right? What's the problem you're trying to solve? For me, resumable online index rebuilds, I want to ask, what's the goddamn problem you're trying to solve? Oh, I get so sick and tired of answering this, asking this question, especially around fragmentation and index rebuilds. I don't get it. I don't get why people think in the day and age of shared storage, where all the servers are sharing the same storage, everybody's intermingling their blocks with each other, there's no such thing as dedicated drives. Why do you think that you want your pages all in a row? There's no such thing, it's imaginary. It doesn't make any sense. What do you think is all in a row? And then, isn't your data changing all the time? So you think you're going to pack it all in nice and neat. And then as soon as you stop, people are immediately doing inserts, updates, and deletes and moving the data all over the place. Even when it is all nice in a row, what do you think? Performance is great? No, users are still complaining. Have them run a query right after the index rebuild finishes. And if they high five you and go, oh my God, you're doing such an amazing job, then first stop and understand whether it's even a parameter sniffing problem. Because half the time, DBCC free proc cache will give you that same result. By freeing the plan cache, you'll get it so that whatever query runs next builds a brand new execution plan and gets this fast query plan that runs really quickly. If you think that rebuilding indexes is solving whatever problem you're trying to solve, try free prop cache. And if that solves it, I'm going to tell you, you didn't even understand the problem you were trying to solve. I have never, count them, never used online index rebuilds as something that would get me across the finish line. And I'll give you just one example of why they suck. When you pause one, you can't make schema changes. 
you can't change anything about that table. You can't start an online index rebuild or an index rebuild on some other column because it'll, SQL Server will throw a warning saying, sorry, you've got an index rebuild that was paused. We still got to go fix something first. There's nothing in SQL Server that will warn you that you have these online index rebuilds pending and hanging and outstanding. Oh, it gets so, such a half-baked feature. I don't understand why they released that. <sighs> not very ladylike, not very demure. Uh, so that should be the end of our uh, office hours. I almost said happy hours, <laughs> uh, which tells you that is not my first gin and tonic. Uh, so I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. God, that what's the problem you're trying to solve? I just don't know how... You know, maybe I need to have Richie modify something in PollGab so that after somebody submits a question, it follows up with, so now what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, I, 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 it's probably a problem for LLMs too. I would imagine that I always like to, to personify uh, whatever is behind the code. And I, I always like to imagine that uh, the chat GPT is a person back there and it's like, oh my God, why is this person asking this question again? What sense does this make? Um, so yeah, anyway, hope you had fun. Hope you learned something. Hope you laughed at least. And I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.